My mom was adopted. At least that's what the government says happened. Me, I called what happened something else. Not adoption, though. Removal? Theft? It's hard to put a name on it. But it wasn't adoption. Not really. You see, my mom is native, and so were her parents. My mom was born in 1947, a couple of years after the end of World War II. About that time, the government was plotting what to do next with people like my mom. They had ended boarding schools, a horrific chapter of American history, where things like this happened. This is audio from a grainy black and white film showing Native children singing Ten Little Indians. The girls and boys in the film look to be about six or seven. The girls are wearing white dresses. The boys are dressed up too. They're Native kids. Boarding schools were designed to obliterate my culture. I should know. My grandparents were forced to attend boarding schools. By 1947, the year my mother was born, the government had closed boarding schools, but they still didn't trust Indian families to raise Indian children. So, they came up with a new, more subtle plan. This is Margaret Jacobs. She's a history professor at the University of Nebraska. You know, the federal government really saw adoption, I think, as the the answer to the perennial Indian problem. The perennial Indian problem? For them, the Indian problem was Indian people are poor. They're dependent on the government. We need them to be just like everybody else in American society so they'll no longer be dependent and won't have this unique status in society anymore. Meaning my mom and my mom's family, the Ojibwe in Minnesota, the Dakota in South Dakota, the Utes in Colorado... The Crow in Montana, all of us were a problem. And one solution to the problem, adoption. And they believed really that Indian cultures could not be maintained, that Indian people did need to shed their tribal identities, shed their tribal sovereignty, and become American. That's right. Indigenous peoples need to become American. This is Stolen Childhoods, a documentary about forced Native adoption in the decades following World War II. But it's not ancient history. It's still affecting people today. My mom's name is Judy Olson, and I'm Melissa Olson. In this hour, you'll hear how forced Native adoption changed my mother's life, my life, and other adoptees, and the children of adoptees. This is me, and what you can't see is there's a big dollhouse. <laughs> and I have this real cheesy grin where my big dimples hang out. <laughs> Not too long ago, my mom pulled out some old photos from her childhood. She's a short woman who always seems to have a twinkle in her eye. I know the basics of her story. Judy Olson born at Minneapolis General Hospital in 1947. When she was seven years old, she was adopted by a white family named Epp. But a lot of what she was telling me was new. For example, she showed me this photo. It's a faded black and white portrait. And this little boy and I would have been brother and sister at that point. And you can see we're happy. You know, we're both smiling or trying to laugh. And we got along famously. But then the dad, I think he had a heart attack and he died. And that was the end of that. I was gone. But I had no idea about this. Turns out she spent years in foster care, living with at least two different white families before the one she was adopted into. Uh, My birth name was actually Emily Marie Smith. 
You've had more than one name? Yes, I had more than one name. Of course, my birth name was Emily Marie Smith. At some point around 1953, I was Judy Lee Lampwright. Then when I was adopted, I was Judy Jean F. That's a lot of name changes, and all before the age of eight. Emily Marie and then Judy Lee Lampwright. How did you get from Emily to Judy? Well, I changed my own name. You changed your own name. Right. Uh, I was thinking about it. Why would I change my birth name? And I, 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 what I have figured out is that I really felt shame. Shame over what? Being an orphan. When my mom first arrived at the Epp home, it was scary. She felt caught up in a tornado, almost like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, which, it turns out, is how she came up with the name. I must have, uh, Judy Garland, I think I had heard that name. I think I had seen a movie. So my mom is seven. She's in a new place with a new family, and it didn't go well. Maybe that's because it was her third home. A social worker came and said, you know, if you don't start taking to these people, we're going to take you back. Either you start calling these people mom and dad and show some affection and act like you want to be here, then we're going to take you away again. I'm like seven or eight, and I'm going, why is this my problem? What did they expect? From the time I could remember, I was at this foster home, that foster home, this foster home, that foster home. I was by myself. I was supposed to figure it out. And here I'm just a little kid, and I'm supposed to figure all this stuff out by myself. Mm -hmm. I was probably pretty difficult. I made the basic effort, and that was about all that anybody got out of me, ever, period. But she sucked it up and tried to fit in, which was confusing for a Native kid living in a tiny town proud of its German-American heritage. New Ulm, Minnesota is one of our state's most beautiful cities. Located 90 miles south of the Twin Cities in the scenic Minnesota River Valley, New Ulm was settled in the early 1850s by a group of German immigrants who wanted to create their own city from the ground up. The New Ulm Waltz, okay, Jeff? New Ulm is so into all things German. Restaurants there sell bratwursts year-round, and there is a big statue of a warrior with a sword pointing towards the sky. His name? Hermann the German. I knew I wasn't German. I knew I wasn't them. So I asked my mom, how did you know? I looked in the mirror. And what did you see when he looked in the I mirror? I saw this brown kid. <laughs> I said, oh, this is me. I'm brown. Why am I brown? Everybody else is white. I'm brown. I was a brown little kid. Did Grandpa and Grandma ever acknowledge that? Or did you talk about that? Oh, I think at one point when I was a little bit older, they said, well, you know, Germans can be really dark. So you were expected to tell people that you were German? Yeah. And that was it. That was it. My mom says living in a small town as the only Native person meant feeling very isolated. It was just a very lonely place to be. Because by the time I got into high school, most of the guys weren't allowed to date me. Yeah, they knew. Their folks would say, no, you're not going out with her. And so was that difficult to learn that? Oh, sure it was. Because it's like, gee, I want to be like everybody else. So I was, I was just pretty much of a loner. Luckily, not every moment at New Ulm High School was joyless. My mom was, and still is, a really good singer. Fifty years ago, pretty much the whole town crowded into a brick gymnasium to hear her act and sing. We put on Little Abner and I was Daisy May, an Indian with a blonde wig. I thought it was kind of funny. I'm past my prime, now I'm doing time. La-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da. 
I'm past my prime. Da, 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 da. When she wasn't performing, my mom ran through the streets of this little town and along country roads, too. I felt pretty lonesome. So you ran? So I ran. Turns out, running wasn't mom coping with the isolation and racism. It was more than that. Partially, I think the other reason why I ran is I had been molested by the Epps mother's father. Yeah. This is her white adoptive grandfather. Grandpa had said, if you tell anybody, I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I learned how to run fast was to stay away from him. He couldn't catch me. Mm -hmm. So I just ran and ran and ran. You know, running out of fear became just uh, the love of running. You know, if I could still run today, I'd be running today. <laughs> because I just you. like I just like running. My mom has gone to therapy for this, and she's talked about it before, but it hit really hard this time. I wonder if other Native adoptees had difficult upbringings too. I knew my friend Mallory's mom was adopted. So, one evening, I went to Mallory's house and talked to them about it. My name is Mallory Moon. And my name is Kip Moon. I belong to a tribe, Standing Rock Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. Kip has long salt and pepper hair. Her mother is Sioux. Her father was white. He rode the rodeo circuit for a living, and so he happened to be out there in Nevada and called for my mom, and she went out there and... I appeared in Nevada. <laughs> like many Native adoptees, Kip isn't exactly sure about how she was adopted. I just don't know how that worked. If we were taken away, if she gave us up, if what the story with that was, I have no idea. Kip ended up living with a white family who lived in South Dakota in a town called Buffalo Gap but she didn't feel like she was a part of the family. And she didn't fit in at school, either. Kip told her daughter how she was shunned by the white kids and the Native kids. They called me an apple, meaning I was red on the outside and white on the inside. Did your adoptive parents help you negotiate issues of race? No, not at all. At one point, I was beaten up and my skull was fractured, and I had black eyes, and they said, get on that bus and go back to school. I was terrified. I ended up being a loner because the natives didn't like me, and the whites didn't want to hang out with me, so I, I really grew up being a loner. What did your adoptive parents always say to you? They brought me up telling me that I should be grateful to them because they saved me from an awful life. But they didn't. They just made everything worse. As it turns out, they made things worse in a lot of ways. Suppers were far and few between. I learned to eat bread and put butter and sugar on it. And I ate a lot of that because my parents never came home. I ate dog food, and which is really sad, but I liked it. It was crunchy, and it was really filling. Yeah, I ate a lot of dog food. Yep, her white adoptive parents couldn't be bothered to make meals. They were too busy drinking. They pushed her to drink, too. When I was probably 16, close to 17, they would take me to the bar, and my dad had said, if you're going to drink when you're 18, you're going to learn to handle your liquor. And he would buy me beer. Your parents made you drink? I don't know how that was okay, but I guess if you're with your parents and they want you, you to drink, you can, which is crazy. So I was drinking High Point beer. By the time I got 18 and went to 3-2 bars, I could put down nine pitchers. And on top of all of that, Kip says... They were just plain cruel. One day, my mom, my adopted mom told me, Oh, by the way, that old heifer that laid you is dead. 
And I was a young kid. I didn't know what that meant. Finally, I realized that she meant that my biological mom had passed away. And what really irks Kip, looking back on it, is the attitude of her white adopted family. I think that they tried, always instilled in me that they did me this huge favor. And so I needed to be thinking that they were the Almighty because they saved me. But they didn't. They just made everything worse. Eventually, the grossly poor parenting landed the family in court. Kip remembers the day she had to talk to the judge. So when he asked me what was wrong, what I felt was wrong, I said, they drink too much. And then my adopted mom jumps up. If we drink, if we drink too much, it's because she drives us to drink. Okay, I need to take a break. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. I walked away from my conversation with Kip and Mallory in awe. Here were two women's lives, my mother Judy and Kip, who were so closely connected. How many others were out there? And how and why did this happen? Up next, historian Margaret Jacobs explains the sales pitch the government used to encourage white families to adopt Native children. Indian people have been shafted, and the way that you can help Indian people is to adopt an Indian child. We'll be back in a moment when Stolen Childhoods continues. I'm Melissa Olson. And this is Stolen Childhoods, a documentary about forced Native adoption. This is the Social Welfare History Archives at the University of Minnesota. It's a big library full of records documenting the history of government assistance in the state. So familiar. Have you been here before? I have. Okay. So I'm not crazy. No. I can recognize my researchers. Excellent. It's good to be back. So I've got space reserved. I realize it has... These days, I don't spend much time in libraries. I'm a legal advocate for Native children. And most of my days are spent inside courtrooms and judges' chambers. Back in the early 2000s, I was a doctoral student at the university. I spent a lot of time in this library... I read primary documents of all sorts. On this day, I'm here to find a very specific document that I want to share with you. Indian Adoption Project, the purpose of the project. The purpose of the Indian Adoption Project is to stimulate the adoption of American Indian children on a nationwide basis. In 1958, the Bureau of Indian Affairs created the Indian Adoption Project. Its goal was simple take Indian kids away from their biological parents. This was not an accident of history. It was a government program designed to save the government money and dismantle tribes, all under the guise of integrating Native children more fully into American society. The Indian unwed mother seldom receives the assistance usually available to the non-Indian. The first time I read about the Indian Adoption Project... I felt like I was falling through a big hole in the floor of this library. I couldn't believe no one had told me about this before. It's still not very well known. Well, here's how it worked. The Bureau of Indian Affairs, also known as the BIA, was and still is the federal agency that carries out Indian policy. When the BIA started the Indian Adoption Project, it enlisted social workers to go to reservations and convince parents to sign away their parental rights. So this wasn't the first time the U.S. government took children away from Indian families. Beginning in the mid-19th century, the BIA established the nation's first boarding school for American Indians. The government schools are constantly being built and hospitals added. This is from a 1929 news report on Indian boarding schools. We bring them in, clean them up, and start them on their way to civilization. 
the Indian Adoption Project had similar goals. Assimilation through the act of removing children from families. To get the project moving, the BIA hired a nonprofit called the Child Welfare League. The man in charge there was named Arnold Lislow. Margaret Jacobs says Lislow was a big booster of the Indian Adoption Project. Lislow and the government believed that adoption would be great because when you removed a child uh, and put them in a non-Indian family, they wouldn't be getting to know other Indian people as they would in a boarding school. They would be hopefully raised in a middle-class family. And so the idea was that they'd be fully assimilated and at no cost to the government. We'll be hearing a lot from Margaret Jacobs in the next few minutes. She wrote a book about forced adoption titled A Generation Removed. In her book, Jacobs says the government viewed Native people as a drag, a problem. Now it thought it found a solution to this quote-unquote problem, but how to sell it to white folks. Indian people have been shafted, and the way that you can help Indian people is to adopt an Indian child. So Lislow gets busy. He, he does these sorts of campaigns. He does a lot of writing. He does a lot of public speaking. He gets articles and everything from good housekeeping to Catholic uh, charities magazine. And those campaigns had a message. One of the most powerful images I found in my research was this image of a little boy, Indian boy, in a diaper, frolicking in the sand. And underneath is a caption, and all it said was, dead end or a chance? And I thought, wow, that encapsulates the attitude of Lislow and many social workers in this period. They believe that if you left Indian children within their own families and communities, it would be a dead end. And if you promoted their adoption and if they were adopted out, they would have a chance. By 1966, when the BIA's Indian Adoption Project had been in full swing for years, the agency was still referencing that children's song. In a press release dated March 14, 1966, a BIA publicist wrote, One little, two little, three little Indians, and 206 more are brightening homes and lives of 172 American families, mostly non-Indians who have taken the Indian waifs as their own. But those numbers are just a snapshot. It's very difficult to estimate the numbers of children who were adopted into white homes. Uh, No one kept statistics on this for a very, very long time. But with individual states adopting similar programs, forced adoption had a big, big impact. Basically, on average, 25 to 35 percent of all American Indian children were living apart from their families in the 1960s and 70s. That's right. During my mother's generation, about one out of every four children grew up away from their biological parents. Individual states also got involved, creating programs similar to the BIA's Indian Adoption Project. During this era, Social workers found devious ways to take babies away from Native mothers. And one of the things I found that really shocked me was um, a form that the Bureau of Indian Affairs developed. It was called Authorization for Discharge of an Infant, something like to a person who's not a family member. So it doesn't say authorization to adopt (laughs) or anything like that. It says nothing about losing one's child or giving up a right in one's child or putting a child up for adoption. It's all this sort of legalistic language that I didn't understand either when I was reading it. And she's got a Ph.D. The consent was, I don't think, truly informed. There was often a lot of subterfuge used to get women to put their children up for adoption. Let's meet another adoptee. My name is Lynn Braveheart. What else should I say? Lynn is a friend of mine. We work together. Like me, she works to protect Native kids in foster care in Minneapolis. I am a guardian ad litem for the 4th Judicial District, and I specialize in Indian child welfare. 
Yes, my mom is an adoptee. She is from the Oglala Lakota Nation in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. And she is she's she was adopted from her tribe and from her family when she was four years old. Lynn's mom bounced around several different foster homes until she was adopted into a white family. She wasn't a great parent to Lynn. I was in foster care till I was 18, and I think a lot of the reasons why I was in foster care and the things happened to me was because my mom was adopted and had gone through so much trauma herself. Lynn says her mom suffered from mental and physical abuse, but won't tell Lynn exactly what happened. In my my heart and my mind, I knew that my mom was suffering. And that's why she drank so much, was to totally check out of this life. Completely just obliviated, you know, drunk. I've never seen anybody that drunk before. Just you're on the couch. She's just completely gone, different person. Sometimes she's an animal. Like my brother once saw her so drunk that she became a like a dog and was behaving like a dog and howling and and, and you know completely out of her mind. Is clearly because of her trauma. Clearly, and I mean I I don't think I had the words to say that when I was sixteen or seventeen, but in my my heart and my mind I knew that my mom was suffering. And that's why she drank so much. Lynn hoped her mother could shake off the past, but it often seemed to get the better of her. When Lynn decided to become a mom, she wanted her mom in the birthing room with her. Lynn's mom agreed, but then... I was in labor, so I called her and I was going to tell her. I was really excited to tell my mom, like, I want you to come to the hospital and be with me while I'm in labor and be there to support me while I have my son. And I called her, and I immediately knew that she was too drunk to to be with me. And so I didn't even tell her I was in labor. I just I just hung up and said goodbye and ha- told her to have a good night. And then I just went through it on my own. And that's been a lot of things in my life that I don't tell her about. Because um, I don't tell her those things because I know it'll hurt her too much. And I feel like she's had enough pain and suffering in her life for me to have to need her, I guess. But then it makes me angry. And I feel very angry about not having a mom there when I need her. So, sorry. It's hard to talk about, especially... (laughs) especially because of today. On the day of this interview, Lynn's mom was a no-show again. She's supposed to be here. I'm just going to say everything. She's supposed to be here for, for me today. Um, is it important for her to, to tell her story? I think I've always thought her story was important to tell. I really have. But, you know, she gets drunk and she does things that harm herself, falling down or she broke her arm last year. She almost broke her neck and has a concussion now, and so it's constantly worrying, and I've had to put up boundaries in my own life because I can't rescue her. I can't save her. I can't make her be sober. I can't I can't do anything except listen and be there and try to support her. It's tough, right? You have to find a balance. I've learned how to cope by lots of therapy, Finding healthy people that I can count on to be there that can take the place. Like I have a best friend who, um, she was there when Max was born. So I've found ways to to develop healthy relationships with people that I know I can count on. She's the mother of two kids now, but she felt she had to turn elsewhere for parenting advice. I think I learned what not to do from my parents, honestly, it might sound weird, but I watch TV. I bet we've been together for... Family Ties was on when I was like, I don't know how old I was. I was probably eight or nine, around the same age. But I, I observed those interactions between the adults. I'm like, our family is totally not like that. <laughs> 
Well, Dad, I was thinking, you know, term papers and exams come and go, but the family unit is the one true constant in life. The precious hours spent in the familiar abode with loved ones playing a heartwarming game such as this are, are what make memories that one can treasure for all eternity. When did all that occur to you? As I was coming down the stairs. So I just decided I need to be there for my kids, number one, and put them first, always. Up next... A daughter searches for her mother's biological parents. I always said, Mom, we should meet your real mom. And she was always kind of real bitter about it. No, why? They gave me up. And More in a moment when Stolen Childhoods continues. Welcome back to Stolen Childhoods a documentary about forced adoption in Native communities. In the 1950s and 60s, tens of thousands of Indian children were adopted into non-Indian families. One of them was Kaylin Davis. She grew up far, far from her people in a working-class suburb of St. Paul, Minnesota. Hello, I'm Kaylin Davis, and I'm old enough. I'm 56 I grew up in South St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm enrolled up in White Earth. That's the White Earth Ojibwe tribe in northern Minnesota. My sister was adopted, and we were like the only native, the only minority, the only dark-colored little people in the whole South St. Paul. You don't fit in, you know, because you're growing up white, and you're not white. But Kaylin didn't feel like she belonged for another reason. My adopted mom, her name was Agnes, and she was real strict and abusive. She was like five foot nine, two hundred and twenty pounds when I was three. Kaylin says she cowered in her presence. She did what she was told, and she put up with her adopted mom's abuse and her lies. My adopted mom, she would cut her hair real short. I mean, really short, and she she didn't say we were Native. She told us we were Mexican. Kaylin never really felt a part of things. She told me it was because of the words her mother chose to describe Kaylin's place in the family. When we were growing up, she would always call us her adopted daughters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really hard. But mostly because of... Uh, uh, you're really that part of the family, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's adopted. She liked her adopted father, who was also white. She describes him as a little more mellow and a hard worker. But he died when she was 10. As an adult, Kaylin struggled with alcohol addiction. And she passed some of those struggles on to her children. One of them, Melissa, thinks Kaylin's alcoholism is a direct result of her adoption. Because of my mom being adopted, you know, I said she struggled with alcohol addiction. I said me and my brothers have all struggled with our own addictions. I said, you know, we, we've we been in jail. We've been, you know, like homeless. Like Lynn, Melissa Davis spent time on the streets and in and out of foster care. Today, Melissa Davis works at a graphic design firm and is the mother of a young daughter. Melissa and Kaylin wanted to meet their biological family and connect to their cultural roots. And they succeeded, kind of. I always said, Mom, we should meet your real mom. And she was always kind of real bitter about it. No, why? They gave me up. And Well, you know what? I never had no good feelings about having a mom. You know, because my mom wasn't a good mom. So why would I want to meet another mom? I didn't grow up with a lot of love. So it's like, I'm not going to get excited. But Melissa persisted. I told my mom when I was 18, I found your real mom. We should take a trip up there. And my mom, she was happy about it. She said, yeah. So we all got in the van and we took a trip up there. And my grandma was sitting in the reservation and she was sitting in the house. And we rolled up there and here she was a short little lady. I was just amazed that she looked just like my mom. And she took us around the reservation. 
she showed us her sisters, but she was kind of a little bit dementia, had Alzheimer's. She didn't really know a lot. We asked her, you know, how come my mom was adopted? And, you know, did she have other kids adopted? And she said yes. And for Melissa, meeting her grandma was all that she had wanted and more. But for Kaylin, it was, well, a bit underwhelming. It was good. At first, I think, um, like, I thought Melissa... Like, you wanted it more than I did. For me, it was like, I was, to me, I felt like I was okay with it without knowing my mom. Meeting her father was a different story. And Kaylin says it's because of the way they treated her. I guess what made me more full as a person was after I met my dad. <sighs> Melissa picks up for her mother. They were really really, you know, traditional people. They brought the sage around. They welcomed us. They gave us blankets, blueberries, wild, you know, wild rice. And they said they gave us blankets because they said, this is from this is from your grandpa because he wants you guys to have a good life. That's how Native Americans should be when we come back. When I met him, I just bawled like a baby. I mean, literally like a baby. I mean, bawled like, oh, my God. That, that seemed like more, it, it filled the void in my life. Finding her father was a big emotional moment for Kaylin Davis. My mother worked really hard to find her family, too. I began searching in 1972. This is my mom, Judy Olson, again. So I was 25, and a friend of mine was an attorney. And we wrote to social services in, in Minneapolis. They said, well, the records are sealed because I was adopted. She was about to give up when... But this one lady said, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but I have a phone number. That phone number was for one of her brothers, Kenny. She worked up the courage and gave him a call. So I immediately went to the phone and dialed the number. And I said, is Kenny Smith there? Pretty soon my brother comes to the phone. I said, I'm your sister, Judy. And then we just started talking. He said, oh, my God. I didn't know I had a sister. And he's, I said, yeah, I was adopted. Did it sort of live up to your expectations? I didn't know what to expect, except all I knew is these are people I'm related to. Finally. The way that my mom tells it, that first meeting started out a bit awkward. We met at our uncle's home, and it was very tense, meaning... We didn't know each other. We didn't know what to say. And we just kind of sat there for the first two hours. But over time, the ice thawed, and she would go over to play cards. And and my brothers are, were just comical. They were just so funny. They loved to have a good time. Later, she also reconnected with her father. My mom tells this one story. A few years after she finds out she's adopted, Mom attends this Native vocational program and for the first time is around other community members. So we had break about 10.30 in the morning and we were going to go to the break room and have coffee and sit and I had no idea what was going to happen. So right off the bat, somebody tells a joke and it starts with one person, the next person adds something, the next person adds something, the next person adds something, here I am. So I add something, and everybody laughed. I said, yes! <laughs> I am funny! <laughs> and that was the beginning of a new me. I knew there was one thing for sure I had in common with Native people. I had a hell of a sense of humor. <laughs> right. For my mom, finding family meant finding herself. For so many years, I had no one. I went online and found everybody in my family through Ancestry.com because they have all of the roles from 1885 to 1940 online. And I went and searched person by person by person and have found everybody in my family. I looked at all of them. And I knew they had been dead for a hundred years. And I said, 
but these people are my family. These are my people. This isn't my adopted family. These are the people that I'm related to. And it was just a feeling of, it was so overwhelming for me to finally find who I was related to. It, I, it just filled up my heart. Finally, I belong. Another cathartic moment for my mom was visiting her old high school in Newell, Minnesota. That's the town where she lived with the white family that adopted her. And now is this Jefferson? Yeah, turn right. And the Nesses lived right here. I used to babysit for them. They lived in this house. He was a teacher too. And what did he teach? Somebody else lives in the house now. We stop to take a few photos, then it's off to what she's really after. Door seven. When we arrive, the school is locked. No, that's not open. But it looks like there's something called the State Street Theater Company here now. This building is under renovation. Office is not always open. If door is locked, call for admittance. Let's try it. It worked. I got a hold of a guy named Paul. Yep, door seven. Okay, bye-bye. Says he can come right over and let us in. I'm Paul Warshower. I'm the uh, executive director for the State Street Theater Company. Oh, wow. And here we are in front of the 1938 WPA Auditorium. And what is your name, young woman? When I lived in New Orleans, my name was Judy Epp. E-P-P. Yes. There's still Epps here, I think, aren't they? No. No? No. As you might have noticed, Paul's an outgoing guy. Well, let's go in and take a look. Now, remember, there's no light, so I just spoke to the president of our board who said, make sure she's escorted everywhere. Uh Uh-huh. And actually, the reason why we're here is I was in a musical that New Alm High School put on, and it was called Little Abner, and I was Daisy May. We step inside. This is where you played Daisy May. Right on this stage right here. On this very stage. Can you see the murals are hanging here? The murals are really important to my mom. We can't see them because of the whole lack of electricity. So Paul tells us about them. The the murals have been here since 38. And imagine in a high school that no one has vandalized them. Can you imagine? You can't do that in a big city. Uh, That one's got a very interesting thing. It shows the, the white guys and the Indians. On the back panel, it shows an Indian getting drunk, which is not... Cool, and then the, my favorite is in the middle. You can't see it now, but it shows the white guy looking at an Indian maiden, and uh, she's got her husband next to her, but she's clearly looking at this white guy like she's very interested. <laughs> then that's the Battle of New Ulm, which shows... Watch out here. I don't want you to yeah, fall off the edge. Fall off. Uh, that's the Battle of New Ulm, which shows the noble savages fighting against the uh, people who lived here, and that, of course, is a Conestoga wagon, which you can... There were no wagons here for the battle, so John Sosha took a little liberty. Okay. What exactly did he mean? Does he know we're native? Well, we move on anyway. And finally, this is my favorite. This is progress. So there's an engineer, an architect, a farmer, and an industrialist all around the crops. And then on the top, there's this beautiful factory belching out black smoke and a rainbow. It really is a very socialist view of the future. The mural tour is over, and it's time to get down to business. My mom is anxious to hear if her voice still carries through the auditorium. I'm past my prime. What a shame. And I'm losing time. Guess the old clock's run down. Seventeen last spring. My, what a wasted life. Still without a ring. When will you be my wife? I'm past my peak. You're an early antique. Look at this physique. (laughs) Just, I don't remember the rest of it. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy how times have changed. Past her prime in high school? Times have changed in other ways, too. After leaving New Ulm, 
questions linger. My mother has changed. She's discovered her roots, gotten to really know her brothers and sisters and her Native American heritage. But has New Ulm changed? Has America changed? Now I want to tell you about something that's a big help to my mom and other adoptees. All dancers, make your way over this way. Come on over, dancers, male and female dancers of all ages. It's a community ceremony called the Adoptee Powwow. And for the past decade or so, it's happened every year at the American Indian Center in Minneapolis. All you dancers, come on over. It's an event for people like my mom. Mallory's mom, and all the other mothers and fathers who grew up outside their cultural home to gather here. Near the entrance, I spot a banner. It reads, Welcome Home. And all welcoming, all our adoptees and all the dentists, and traditional, I just say, welcome to you. I arrive with my mom. Immediately, her eyes light up. She spots a friend, a woman named Beverly Cloud. Last year was my first time I came to the adoptees Powwow, and so then I met Judy and you know several of them that are out there. So you liked it? I did. Yeah, it was pretty emotional though, because you pretty much cry all morning in the group, you know. I watch Mom and Beverly go upstairs to a special space, only for adoptees to get together and share their stories. An hour or so later, they come back down for grand entry, the song that officially starts the powwow. Adoptees dress in shawls and dance to the music, forming circles around one another. The event is pretty emotional and not always so easy. Kaylin Davis emerges from the crowd of dancers. Remember Kaylin? She grew up in a working class suburb of St. Paul. She and her adopted sister were pretty much the only brown faces in town. What's that? I said I gotta go to the bathroom and start crying. Okay, don't start crying. <laughs> I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad you came. I'll go upstairs for a while. Okay, oh yeah, I thought so. Okay. Stories, how other people, their experiences with adoption, and how they're a lot of them are so much alike, right? You know, those feelings, yeah. It's like, oh my god, that one lady that was talking, and I'm like, ah, oh, just crying away for her, you know. It's like, you know, because that is such a deep hurt. <laughs> After grand entry, I see Mallory Moon and her mom Kip. You met her earlier, too. Kip grew up in South Dakota. Her parents drank too much. Seeing you out there dancing, Mom. You look so pretty. Thank you. I was nervous. You are nervous? It was okay after I just stopped trying to keep the beat and just went with it. It was okay. It was a nice thing that they have here for um, people like us to... Welcome us home, you know? Wow. Do you ever think that we would be here today, Mom? Not in my wildest dreams. My parents were white, and I grew up in a all-white society, per se, you know? Like, I would see natives, but they were just beyond my reach. Didn't have a clue about their traditions or anything. But I got it now. I'm, I'm here. Then everyone gathers to hear the adoptee song. This is the adoptee song nationally, internationally. It belongs to not me, but to you. I ho, hey, oh, hey, oh. I ho, hey, oh, hey, oh. Hey, hey, hey. I As I listen to the song, my mind wanders a bit. I think of my mother, of course. But not just her. I see the hope in the faces of Kip and Kaylin and dozens of other people I don't even know. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh. 
They're here to get back part of what was taken from them, their culture, their identity, their sense of what it means to be Native. Gaining that sense of belonging doesn't happen overnight, but I'm relieved that it seems to be happening here, little by little. Stolen Childhoods was written and produced by Ryan Katz and me, Melissa Olson. Our editor was Todd Melby. Special thanks to all the women that we interviewed for this documentary. Support for Stolen Childhoods was made possible by KFAI Fresh Air Radio in Minneapolis, St. Paul, with funding from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Additional funding was provided by the Tawahe Foundation and the Shakopee Midewakanton Sioux Community. Thanks for listening.